Greetings, everyone. I'm James P. Madonna of Mega Life 21, and welcome to Mega Life 21 Live. And uh, today on our show, we have a very special guest: the return of the one and only, the evangelist can create, who is standing right here. Welcome back, sir. Glad to be back. Yes, and we have, aside from Ken Create, assisting the evangelist Ken Create in his talk, uh, sermon, whatever you want to call it, is uh, uh, a longtime friend and associate and a very knowledgeable person in the Word, and uh, his name is Brother Bob. Brother Bob, welcome. Hi. I'm Bob. How are you doing? Good. Very good. Okay, Brother Bob will be assisting uh, the Evangelist Can Create. Now I turn it over to the Evangelist Can Create and Brother Bob. Oops. Okay. Thank you, James. Got Brother Bob over here. Brother Bob helps me out. Certain verses, some things might come to my mind. But I don't know where to go to the verses. So I have Brother Bob here. He's very intelligent. And I thank God for Brother Bob. And he knows the word, which is fantastic. And he knows the grace message. Okay, we're going to flip around a couple things here. Because there's a lot of confusion that's going on in the body of Christ. You see, we're saved by God's grace. The people in the body of Christ understand that. But since we're living in the last days, and Christ can return at any minute, in the Bible it says before Christ returns, there's going to be a falling away. So everything that God has shown me, I see it kind of falling away where people are going to other doctrines. And once you go to other doctrines and start preaching on prosperity messages, and God's going to give you this, and he's going to give you that, and you run towards them, then you take your eyes off of Christ. And our focus, our main focus has to be on Christ, and how to edify and build up the body of Christ, and also how to go out and to teach people who don't know the grace message, and also to go out to the unsaved people and get the message to them about salvation. Now, before we go into the lesson, the teachings, I want to explain a little bit what does it mean to be an evangelist. An evangelist is somebody who goes out and preaches the word of God to people that don't know Christ. So that's what we do. We're evangelists. We're not pastors. We're not preachers. But in the Bible, in Paul's letters, according to how far you are in the faith and how much you're growing, how much you have your eyes on Christ, the more you're in the Word and the more that God teaches you, it comes to a point, if you know the grace message, Paul says, now you can go out and teach other people where there's confusion to break that confusion. So this is what we do. We teach the Word. You have preachers, you have pastors, they have flocks. But the only problem is when it comes to the preachers and the pastors is... They're almost being caught up with putting themselves up on the pedestal and taking Christ off the throne. And you can't do that because in the Bible it says you're going to be highly accountable for what was given to you. So when people come along and say they're pastors, they're preachers, you better have your life in order. So when you preach, you better be preaching the Word of God, being controlled by the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit takes over the preaching. You see, when I teach and Brother Bob goes out and gets the word to people, it's all from the word of God, but we're letting the Holy Spirit control us that when we speak, the Spirit takes over our language. So there's no confusion because there's so much going on today in confusion in the body of Christ that it has to be broken. So I just want to get that across to the people out there. And now we're going to go into our lesson. And we're going to go into Galatians chapter 5. Where we're talking about the flesh that versus the spirit. So now if we go to Galatians 5.19. Brother Bob, could you read that? 
Yes. Galatians 5.19 The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, now, what I have here, the old sinful nature loves to do evil, which is this opposed from what the Holy Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposed from what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. And your choices are never free from the conflict. But when you are directed by the Holy Spirit, controlled by the Holy Spirit, you are no longer under and subject to the law. Now we got to explain what we're talking about with the law. You see, God wrote the Ten Commandments, the law. So before you come to Christ and Christ becomes your Savior, you're putting yourself under the law. Now, all the law is showing you and showing us is you're a sinner. And you need Christ as your Savior. See, Christ, when he died on the cross and he shed his blood and he rose from the dead, he fulfilled the law. So the only way you get to the Father now is through Christ. And the only way you're forgiven is by the blood of Christ. So now you're under grace. But if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you're putting yourself under the law. Now, that we have confusion here in the body of Christ today is people are saved by grace, but they're mixing the law back in with grace. And Paul says, God forbid, why are you going back under that? That's where you came from. So the law just shows us that you're a sinner and you need Christ as a Savior. So before you come to Christ, the law shows you you're a sinner. Now, we're going to get into the flesh here and the workings of the flesh. We have fornication. Fornication could be a different thing. It's unlawful. It's sex between two unmarried people. How big is that today? That is going on so rapidly that back in the 70s, you had different TV shows. You had the one, what was what was that TV show called? Uh, With John Ritter? Oh, Three's Company? Three's Company. Okay, they weren't sexually having sex, but there that was two women living with a man. Well, you also had uh, swingers clubs in New, yeah, in New York clubs. and Los Angeles called Plato's Retreat. You had, yes, exactly. Where people swapped exactly. wives. They were married and they swapped wives and husbands with other couples. Right. Now you, now you also have where you have a man and woman living together. They don't want to get married because they feel if they do get married, down the line they might get divorced. So they live together. And in their sexual bed, they're doing what they do. Yeah, the so-called open relationships, that right. I like to call it. Okay, but God calls that fornication. Dirty magazines, fornication. How many people run to the dirty magazines because they're not connected to their spouse? Or, or, or porno websites. Right, exactly. Okay, now you have uncleanness. This is dealing with drugs. This is dealing with... Filthy stuff. How many people are on drugs today because they have to feed the appetite of their empty soul, their heart? It's empty. I know I had problems with the drugs and drinking. And I loved the party all the time. And when I woke up in the morning, I couldn't wait to smoke a joint and have a cup of coffee. That was my thing. I went to work, I worked, we had our coffee break, I was outside, 
smoking a joint. That was my thing. Went back to work, had lunch. On my lunch break, after I was done eating, I smoke a joint. Went back to work, finished up, way home, maybe smoked a joint, or went home and ate, had to smoke a joint. I loved to party. Then I got involved with the hard drugs. I got involved with the alcohol. And that's a dead end street. But like I said, I love to party. And this became my life. I love rock and roll. It was like sex and drugs and rock and roll. All three go together. This is what these rock bands do. But you got to realize there's an unclean spirit who's the prince of darkness and his name is Satan. His name is the devil. He's a fallen angel. He comes and bombards our flesh. Sex, drugs, rock and roll. And That's what and he's about. And debauchery. That's what he's about. You think that uh, sexually transmitted diseases might be a form of punishment? Absolutely. All right. Then you have variances. This is a difference of opinions. People have different opinions. Oh, I'm right. No, you're wrong. No, that's not what it is. You go by what I say. Then you have wrath. That's rage. That's violence. That's angry. How many people today are angry? Especially here on the Northeast Coast. How many people are stressed out? How many people are on the edge? How many people, when you're driving your car, do you see, like, it's like they got to get there and they're going nowhere. Or they cut you off. Or they go through stop signs. Or they give you the middle finger. They, How many people are doing this today? Or they tailgate you. Or the they tailgate you. Or it's like you're online and you're impatient on the line. How many people are doing this today? How many people are angry? You see, when you're growing and controlled by the Holy Spirit, God's going to show you something when you talk to people. He's showing me things of people's faces. And it's almost they look like they're distorted. There's an ugliness about them. Negativity. There's, yes. there's, a, there's a darkness about them. That's You're seeing this. Because the more you grow spiritualized, God is starting to show you stuff because you're connected with the Holy Spirit. Eventually, now you have... I'm sorry. Now you have seductions. That's rebellion against authority. How many people are doing this... Even in the sports world, they think they're like they're a king. They sit in a mansion. They make millions of dollars, so they believe they're above the law. So now, if they get caught drunk and drive them, there's ones that get away with it because the cop recognizes the individual and sees them as a sports star. So it's like, could I have your autograph? And he lets them go. But now how many are caught? And the penalty is just to fine. But how many are caught that are like nobody that go to jail? But this is the system that we live in. You have heresies. A doctrine is opinion about religion. How many people come across with different opinion, opinions about religions? How many religions are out there? You can't even name how many religions are out there. But you know what? They're there. You have religions say you find God inside yourself. You have religions that say meditate and you can get to God. There's so many different opinions about religions and it's all false. Now, when you go to the other side, you're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Now, Bob, if you go down into chapter 5, where do you find the fruit of the Spirit? And would you like to read that? You find it at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, 
Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Okay, thank you, Brother Bob. Now, you're seeing the fruit of the Spirit, which is different than the works of the flesh. If you go love, what's the opposite of love? Hate. If you go joy, what's the opposite of that? It's like people think they're happy, but they're not. Peace, what's the opposite of peace? War. Long-suffering, what are you suffering for as a believer? You're suffering because you put your faith in Christ. The Bible says, come out of this world. Don't be part of this world. So the more you come out of this world, and the more you got your eyes on Christ, you're going to suffer as a believer. Then we have gentle. Be gentle to people. Then we have goodness. Be goodness. Show good to people. Your light. Shine God's light. Patience. Don't we all deal with patience? Don't we deal with we're impatient? Like a microwave, you want to stick it in there, and I want my food now. Can't we be like more patient? Can't we be more patient with people? Why are we so impatient? Now, we go here. If you live by the Spirit, let's walk by it. These are the big things of growing as a Christian. You got to be filled up with the Holy Spirit. So every time you wake up in the morning, you should ask God and give Him the right to say, Lord, you fill me up with the Holy Spirit. I'm empty today. Fill me up. Let the Holy Spirit control my life today. And what the problem is, is with believers, they think they're filled up when they're not. Every day brings on different adventures. Every day brings on a different day of problems and situations you're going to go through. So every day we wake up, we should ask God to fill us up with the Holy Spirit and give Him the right to fill us up because this is what God wants to do in our life. He wants us to be filled up. But we got to raise our hands and say, I give up, Lord. My desire is to live for Christ. I can't do it, but I know the Holy Spirit can control my life today. And this is what we have to do. And there's too many Christians that think they get it, and they don't get it. And that's a conflict with the flesh. Now, we're going to go into... How do we deal with the flesh that versus the spirit? Now, Brother Bob, do you know where you can find that in scriptures where it talks about putting the full armor of God on? Yeah, that's found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 40. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. Stand then, Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, which can you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of, e of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, that wherever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly 
make known the mystery of the gospel, for I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Okay, where did you find that, Bob? Ephesians chapter 6. Okay, so now Bob read that, and now we're going to break down Ephesians chapter 6. Okay, and what was that verse? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 19. Okay, final word, be strong in the Lord's mighty power. Do you understand what that means? You have the Holy Spirit living inside you. You have to let the Holy Spirit control you. You have to be filled up with the Holy Spirit. Now, when you are filled up with the Holy Spirit, you have this tremendous power that lives inside you. Your Creator is living inside you. The only way you can overcome sin, flesh, and the devil, okay, is when you are strengthened with God's power. That's why if you're unsaved, you have no power to overcome sin. But if you're a believer, you have the power built within you to overcome sin. Now, it says that we don't fight against flesh and blood. So you as a believer, if you think you get an argument with an individual, you're fighting against that flesh and blood. It's not what you're fighting against. You're fighting against the devil. And he's sitting in heavenly places. You see, the devil has his throne that is sitting in the heavenly places. The demons, which are fallen angels, are sitting in heavenly places. So when I met individuals, Christians, and I told them about that, they don't believe that. They believe they're on this earth and they're not sitting in the heavenly place. But Brother Bob just read it to you, and it's in the Word of God where they are sitting. Okay? So now when you come across believers like this or preachers who preach this, they're confusing you in the body of Christ. Because like I said, there's so much confusion going on in the body of Christ. So when you fight, you're not fighting against flesh. You're not fighting against people. You're fighting against the devil. And the Bible says you have to put on the full own armor and be strengthened with his might. So when you have the full armor on, you're being protected. God protects you because the Holy Spirit is controlling you. So this is what we're fighting against. We ain't fighting against people. People who are unsaved, they're doing their thing. This is who they are. This is what they do. We're fighting against, not them, we're fighting against the principalities that sit in heavenly places. And what the problem is, is like if something's coming your way and you get caught in that comfort zone, but now all of a sudden you're going through a trial or a tribulation or a persecution and you sit back and you can't handle it, it's like you slink away and you fall back into the world. And now the devil looks at you and says, I don't have to worry about that individual, but we'll keep an eye on that individual. We got to go attack the ones that are growing in the faith. We got to go attack the ones that know the grace message. We got to take their eyes off of Christ and put their eyes on the world and themselves. And we have a problem in the body of Christ because you have messages going out there of prosperity messages like I was talking about. God's going to give you this. Name it and claim it and it's yours. Too many Christians are going this way. And when you put your mind on these material things, and this is where your mindset, you just took your eyes off of Christ. I know, <clears throat> before I was a believer, my life was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's where my mindset was, and this is what I did, and this is who I was. Now today, that's not me no more, 
because I'm a new person, a new creation in Christ. And when you take your eyes off of Christ and you fall back into the world, the devil looks at you, okay, and he just, he, it's almost like he's laughing at you. He looks at you like you're a joke. But if you're on fire for Christ and you're growing in Christ, he doesn't like that. So he's going to come and he's going to attack you. And he's going to attack you hard. You might lose friends. You might lose family members. You might lose your job. You might end up on the street. You're being persecuted. You're being mocked. You're going through trials. You're going through tribulations. But what does the Bible say? Count it all joy for my name's sake. So if you're going through all this stuff and you're pleasing God, God's joy is overflowing in your life. And when you have God's joy, it's like you ain't worried about nothing. You got peace. You got rest. You got security. All in Christ. And if you're growing spiritual wise, what are you going to worry about? My life, yeah, there's changes that have to come in my life. Just like Brother Bob, Brother James, we all have to go through changes. This is called spiritual growth. The Bible says to be content with contentment. You know, ha uh, happiness, Absolutely. happiness and prosperity doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of money. Absolutely. It could be it take many forms. Uh excuse me, Brother Bob, if you need to get close to the light, be my guest. No, it's okay. Okay, good, good, very good. Okay, so what I'm saying is unsaved people run to material things. This is who they are, this is what they do. They want the mansions, they want the money, they want the fame. And other people fall in their footsteps. You take shows like American Idol. What is that show? Idol. Idol. Worshipping other individuals. How many people say, me being a Christian entertainer, okay, before I came to Christ, man, I watched every Michael Jackson video. And I looked at him, Fred Astaire, Gene Kelly, I looked at these guys like they were mentors in my life. Almost like they were my idols. I want to be like them. The Bible says your idol should be Jesus Christ. But that's you as a believer. If you're unsaved, you're going to idolize these people. You're going to want to follow in their footsteps. If they have things going on positive, you want to follow in their footsteps. But that's good works. And good works don't get you right with God. Only the blood of Christ gets you right with the Father. So now, as you as a believer, if you're going to pray, you got to go through Christ to get to the Father. As you as an unsaved person, if you pray and you're not covered by the blood of Christ and He's not your Savior, you can't get to the Father. The only way you get to the Father is through Christ. So us as believers, we have to be growing and keeping our eyes on Christ. Now, Brother Bob, I want to go to a passage that maybe you know where to go, where it talks about how God is molding us and shaping us into the image of Christ. Do you know where we can find that? Let's see. To the best of my knowledge, I guess I'll try Romans chapter 5. We're going to go to Romans chapter 5. Let's see. Okay. I'll try... Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only we, but we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us okay we'll stop right there now everything that brother Bob talked about was just what I was talking about the 
persecution, the pain, the suffering we're going to go through. But you see, you're sharing in God's glory. The amazing thing about God is He wants to share with you what He has. I mean, how awesome is that? Well, if Brother Bob can look up the passage where it talks about how God is molding us and shaping us into the image of Christ. Okay? And it's also talking about we are new creations in Christ. Now, Brother Bob, if you can find that and read that, that would be really good. So first you're going to look for, all right? Yeah. Molding and shaping us into Christ. So I just want to talk about that a little bit. You see, what it is, is before you become a believer, the angels look at you almost like you're worthless. But see, God is looking at you in a different way. He's working on your heart. So the closer you're coming to the message, and you receive that message... And you accept Christ as your Savior. God does a miracle from up above. And the Holy Spirit comes into you. Now you're covered by the blood of Jesus. Now God starts working on you. He starts to mold you and shape you into the image of Christ. So what that means is you're not becoming Christ. You're taking on his characteristics. And the more you let God start to mold you and shape you in Christ, the more you're going to grow spiritualized. And this is what God loves to do. He loves to take a sinner like he did with Paul. But before Paul's name was changed, he was Saul. Now when he was Saul, he sat in high authority with the Pharisees. And he knew the law. But what he did was when the 12 apostles went out and taught to people how to be saved and to be covered by the blood of Christ, Saul came in and persecuted them. Don't listen to these people. In fact, he even killed Christians. So now, there came a point on their journey, they were going to Damascus. And on that road, Paul was following them. But then he seen a great light. And that light blinded him, and that light was Christ and said to Saul, 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 why do you persecute me? He blinded him. But he gave him the message and changed his name to Paul and told him to go to the Gentile, Gentiles and preach you're saved by my grace. So now, what happened was, it's almost like Saul was the devil's man. And the devil loved this. But God looked at Saul in a different way. A totally different way. The angels looked at Saul almost like to say, that guy will never become a believer. But what God did was he changed it up. He saved Paul and he told them to go to the Gentiles. So when he was growing, God was molding and shaping him into the image of Jesus Christ. He humbled them too. He humbled them through the things he went through. But the angels look in on this and they're amazed how this man is changing. So now... Since he's changing, and the world hated him, just like the world hates you, and he was coming out of the, this world, and all the high authorities were finding out about him, they want to silence him. So they captured him, and he was in jails, different jail cells. In Paul's letters, there is different things where you talk in Galatians, Ephesians, he was bound in chain in jail. But he got the word out to certain individuals to go to the churches. God was molding and shaping him. But he says he was the chief of sinners. Almost like 
Paul looking at the individual believer saying, look, if God saved me and I was the worst and I persecuted Christians and I killed Christians, if he saved me, he can save anybody he wants. So Paul had a passion for Christ. Do we still have that same passion? Do we have that passion that Paul has? And are we giving God the right to mold and shape us into the image of Christ? I mean, even in my life with the, with the drugs and with the alcohol, and God took them away from me, that was my old man. That was my old self. God molded me, changing me into the individual he wants me to be for his glory. So God gets the glory. It's about the Lord. It ain't about me. It's about him getting a glory. So now when I give a testimony to people, that's going to edify and build them up. But they're going to see what God is doing in my life. And maybe they'll receive that to say, what about me? But you see, what we do is we take our salvation lightly and we take it for granted. And you as a believer cannot do that because you will never grow spiritual-wise. And the devil will look at you and say, they're down. Keep an eye on them. Keep them down. This is what he wants to do in our lives. He wants us to get off of Christ and concentrate on the world. I mean, how big is it today in the sports world? Now you got the Super Bowl coming up. Which people don't even watch football. But when that game comes on, they're all glued in front of the TV. Look at the commercials. Look how much money is going out. It's becoming entertainment. So instead of you being in the Bible, studying your Bible, you're watching the Super Bowl. So it's almost like God saying to you, what's more important, that stupid Super Bowl or my word? But we run to the Super Bowl. We watch the commercials. We watch the Super Bowl. Or if you like basketball, which I do. I like, I like sports. I watch sports. I grew up in sports. But there's a time and a place for that. And there's a time and there's a place for the Lord. I mean, I put on fan, the sports channel. I like listening to it. Here and there, I listen to it. But when you hear these people talk, like my team got beat, and it's almost like they're talking like they want to jump off a bridge. That's their life. That's your life? What do you talk about sports? What do you care about sports? What restaurant are you going to go to? What club are you going to go to? Is the drugs coming in? Am I going to get drunk tonight? That's the unsafe people. It has affected the body of Christ. And you know what? That's not a good thing. You're not going to grow. Because soon, very soon, Christ is ready to return. And Christ is going to look at you as a believer. And he's not going to judge you. Because of your sin, that's paid for. You're going to get judged according to what you did with Christ after you became a believer. Okay? So were you a doer and a walker? Or were you a sitter and a talker? A lot of Christians that I know, that I'm in contact with, all they do is talk. They're idle. They sit and complain. God can't use you if you complain and you talk about other people and you sit and you do nothing. He can't use you. I have friends who were believers and they got their mindset on money. And they want to sit in mansions and how to better themselves financially. You're taking your eyes off of Christ. How many churches have I been in, Brother Bob's been in, all right, where I walk in and it's like, I have to present and talk to the individuals about Christ. Can I just walk into a church that I'm visiting or people I know where they approach me and they talk about the word? Where's it coming from their end? So now I talk about it. So now I get a response. So they're talking about it. Hey, don't get me wrong. That's cool. You're edifying. That's great. But where's it coming from the other end? I have another individual 
who's a friend of mine. He's a believer. When we talk, we hang out. How come I always got to talk about Christ in the Bible? Where's his conversation? And now this other individual says to me, oh, no, he's growing. And I look at her and say, he's not growing. Because if he was growing and I was talking to him, he can relate with me. He's on the same page as me. He can't relate to me. He's not on the same page as me. When, when we pal around together, you think he say to me, Hey, Ken, look what I read in scriptures today, or look what I found. Oh, I can look at my friend and say, Whoa, that's really good. So why do I always have to talk to him about Christ? Something wrong with that picture. It's invaded the body of Christ. The Bible says, Come out of this world. Don't be part of this world. Renew your mind in Christ. This world is passing away. So when you leave this world, it passed away. You can't come back here. You're going to leave it all behind. Your money, your cars, your houses, whatever you possess is left behind. It's gone. It passed away. So why are you putting your treasures and you putting your mind and concentrating on this world when it's passing away. We got to wake up. We got to wake up in the body of Christ because when the last individual is saved under God's grace, we're out of here, which is called the rapture. And you don't want to be caught up in the air in the rapture off guard. That's why the disciple said to Christ, when is the time and when is the hour? And he says, no man knows the time or the hour. Not even the Son of Man, but the Father knows the time and the hour. So was that a mystery he was hiding from them? How come, if that was a mystery, how come that was hidden? Maybe because he's not giving you the time and the hour. Because if you knew around that time or that hour, he was going to return. You as a believer are going to get your act together. You see what I'm trying to say? So maybe God keeps that a mystery from us. Okay? That when Christ comes back, He's coming back when you least expect it. That's why when somebody gets robbed, a thief robs your house, they rob it when you're off guard. Okay? Either when you're not there or you're sleeping and you're totally... They know. They know the whole layout of your house. They come and tag when you're off guard. That's how they attack. They're not going to attack when you're waiting for them. They attack when you're not waiting for them. And that's what we have a problem in the body of Christ. And the Bible says there will be a falling away before Christ returns. I'm saying it. I do shows in the body of Christ. Now, James knows about that. Brother Bob knows about that. I mean, how many times have I done it and I heard the preacher say, take my number. Um, take my number, call me, we'll set something up. You can come in, perform for the kids and do some children's shows. Great. I call up. I don't even get a call back. That's a preacher. <laughs> how does that make me feel? Now I come across other Christians. Well, maybe that's not your arena. That's not what it's about. All right? It's about you can't return a telephone call. That's what we're talking about. But these individuals get behind the pulpit and preach a message and put down other people and they can't even give you a return call. Something's wrong with that picture. You know, I press on. I don't worry about that. I pray for them individuals. Now, just imagine somebody else comes along and they're growing, but they're still weak. And that happens to them. Are they going to fall away because of the preacher? Or are they going to be in the Word, understand the Word, grow in the Word, and press on? And just pray for that preacher? We have problems, big time problems in the body of Christ that have to change. I'm, I'm very fascinated with 2 Timothy. Because 2 Timothy describes how people will become in the end times. Alright, you know what? Let's go to that. Bob, let's go to 2 Timothy. Uh, 
Uh, let's see. Okay, we're right here. Chapter 3. This is the dangers of the last days. You should also know of this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be lustful, proud, scuffing at God, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving, unforgiving. They will slander others, have no self-control. They will be cruel, have no interest in what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, pulled up with pride, puffed up with pride, love fleshers rather than God. They will act as if they are religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. You must stay away from people like that. This is just what we were talking about. You got to stay away from people like this, okay? It's talking about the ungodly, but also in there are Christians like living like this, huh? So we got a problem here. There's a problem in the body of Christ. This is a big problem in the USA. Don't you see where it says here pleasures, boastful, proud? Pleasures in what? Pleasures in what? Sports, drugs, alcohol, music, sex, pleasures. The appetite has to be filled inside. They're empty. You know, do you realize when I used to go to bars, what's it say in the Bible? Don't get drunk with wine, but be filled up with the Holy Spirit. That people that do get drunk and do their carousing, they do it at night. How true is that? You used to come out of work and what? You go home, take a shower, eat. It's nighttime, go to the bar. But who do you meet at your bar? At the bar, your friends and people sitting there, all getting drunk, all getting tanked. Why? Because they're lonely people. Yeah. Well, and they got to fill the emptiness inside them to make them happy. Something missing in, inside. Them. Okay. So now, what do we have in the bars? Happy hour. Happy time. The drinks are cheap. Drink them all up. I used to go to a bar with my one friend. And he used to line their drinks up. Because he knew in the course of that hour, after that hour, they were going back to the original price. <laughs> he had five drinks lined up at a cheap yeah. price. And then when he drank them, and now time was running short, he five more. Give me five more. All right, yeah. now uh, the happy hour is over, and now people are, are walking around like, I'm happy, I'm happy, I know, yeah, Ooh, let's go smoke cigarettes, yeah, let's go smoke a joint. Man, that's a great tuna on the jukebox. Yeah, we're happy. Yeah, we're having fun. You ain't happy. And then the kids do ecstasy. You when ain't go, happy. Nah. That's not being happy. I, I mean, the disciples, they definitely drank wine, but they didn't get drunk. No, because the Bible says don't get drunk. Don't get drunk. Okay, it doesn't say you can't have a glass of wine. Right, that's where they made the mistake during Prohibition. The right, people were, but were, see, what yeah. the problem is, is with believers, okay, they don't, they abstain from alcohol because they think it could lead to them liking it and getting involved with That's that. their choice. Okay, you don't have to go here. Exactly. All right, because the one guy says, well, how, one preacher says, well, how can I not become an alcoholic? And the preacher says, don't pick up the bottle and drink it. Self-control. Okay, because that one drink, that one drink can lead to you being an alcoholic. One drink, because I've seen it happen to my friends. I had one friend who passed away, he was an alcoholic. That one drink, a glass of beer from his father when he was 12 years old. That led to him being a drunk and dying an alcoholic. One joint. One joint can lead you and move you in the directions where you're a drug addict. Now when people say, no, that can never happen. They don't know what they're talking about. Because with myself, one joint. 
like the cocaine, like the angel dust, acid, mescaline. People know what I'm talking about. Quaaludes, down, ups, cocaine, one joint. Led to all them other drugs. So you got it. Peer pressure is big. It's big. It's huge. So what is it? The high, uh, the high becomes boring with the, with smoking pot. Well, because what it is is it wears off, okay. And it's almost like when something new comes into your neighborhood, you want to try that and go into another higher level of feeling good. So when cocaine came around and you snorted the coke, you felt like a million bucks. You felt like you could do anything. And you loved it. But then another drug came along. And now you got today, you got ecstasy, you, you got the pharmaceutical pills that kids are taking. Yeah. All right? And they're drinking with it. They're getting, like, drunk. Okay? Their bodies are like, forget about it. Okay? They're right. walking around in the... Um, a stupor. Like that song from the 80s, I found a new drug or something like that. Yeah, that? Huey Lewis? Got, a, yeah got, got a new drug. Yeah. Got a new drug. Uh, uh, Huey, Why? Huey Lewis, right? Why? Because they're empty inside. People that are empty inside can run to the money. Want the money. Want the power to fill that emptiness inside them. Then they get a boat. They like the boat. They have the boat for five years. They get sick of the boat. What's going to make me happy? A bigger boat. So they go and buy a bigger boat. Like greed. So a couple of years later, that wears off. Oh, let me just get that car. That'll make me happy. I'll be fulfilled. So they get that car. Four years later, oh, I got to get a bet. That's it. It never ends. I want a Lamborghini. I want a Ferrari. I want a whole collection of everything. It never ends. Ends because you have emptiness inside you. When God created you and you came out of your mother's womb, there's a void inside you. What we all have. Doesn't don't rich people feel that they're giving their children love by buying them things? Well, all the that's time? what they think. Or get off my back. Get off my back. Like that's their way of expressing uh, being a parent. It's just to keep buying the material. Yeah, and they don't show love. Just give, and that's like I'm showing you love. Right. And then the kids get spoiled. Okay. Then when it gets to a point where the kids should be working, and the parent says, "Well, I gave you this, that, and the other thing. Now it's time to go to work." They're like, oh, "I don't want to go to work." <laughs> what's that? Yeah. I never did it, and I'm not going to do it. And what's with young people being obsessed with texting? They they have become so antisocial, and 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 it, and now they're texting while they're driving, and they're getting killed in car accidents. You know, it's an obsession. They have they have lost uh, social skills. They don't com they don't know how to communicate with other people anymore. Okay, we're going to end up here now. Because this was, you know, I think this was a good teaching. That's outstanding. This is a very special day, in my opinion. Outstanding okay. show. So now we're going to end up here with the Holy Spirit and just give you some verses. Colossians 2, 7 says, let Christ build you up. You have to walk in the Spirit. you got to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. You have to renew your mind in Christ. You have to be in the Word. And you have to be in prayer, and you have to be in good fellowship where the body of Christ is going to edify you, build you up, and motivate you. And you pray for each other. You know, the problem is when you go to church, and people are talking about sports, fishing, where are you going to go to eat? That's not why you're in fellowship. You're there for Christ. You're there to serve one another, to edify one another, to build up one another. So you're getting ready for your work week to go out there on that battlefield, then you have the full armor of God on. See, when I grew up as a Roman Catholic, but I, one of the things I didn't like about it was that you go to, these people went to church, went to Mass every Sunday, all dressed up to the max, to the hilt, and, and nobody got to know anybody in church. Nobody, I mean, you know, the, the priest said, okay, uh, greet your your fellow person and say, all right, peace be with you. And they, they barely shake your hand to the right, to the left, and back at them, peace be with you, peace be with you, peace be with you. 
and they would leave, and nobody would, there was no fellowship. No fellowship at all. Whatsoever. And that's not good. And it's affected the body of Christ. I mean, one guy asked me to go to his church to visit. I'm like, okay. So it's like, well, do you have a sharing time? And almost he looked at me like, what's that? I says, well, you know, when, when you come in and you're new coming in, you raise your hand and you can say, you know, I'm glad to be here. This is my name. Okay. And I'm visiting. Oh, yeah, you could do that. Okay, well, that's good, but then could I share something with them, what God's doing in my life? No, you can't do that. So you know what I said to that individual? I don't want to go to your church. That, that totally doesn't make sense that they said that to you. So he says to me, how come you don't want to come to the church where I go to? Well, because the reason is, is you're keeping people closed-minded. Okay? If I'm coming in and visiting, and I raise my hand and tell them who I am, I'm supposed to edify that body of Christ and motivate that body of Christ. So maybe it's a, it's a, it would be like a domino effect affecting other people. But, but if I come yeah. in and it's, I raise my hand and say I'm a visitor and I'm sitting down and then when the service is over, you're talking about where you're going to go to eat or did you watch the Knicks last night? I don't want to be there. But in his eyes, it was all about the pastor only. No well, yeah, else. well, yeah, because they're looking at him like he's up on a pedestal. Too much of that's going on, and that's not good. Because where me and brother Bob were going, we had sharing time. Our pastor would say, "Anybody want to share some? Anybody got a testimony? It's open to you." That's how it should be. Yeah. You're edifying the body of Christ. It helps you grow. Well, yeah, because like you're a unit. And the Bible says, with two or more gather in my name, there's power there. Because don't forget, when that's over and you're going into Monday, you got a whole work week ahead of you. Are you equipped? Are you ready? Yeah. There's a battlefield out there. I mean, what's the point in calling somebody brother if there's no brotherhood? Uh, I, I agree with you. you. Know, there's no fellowship. I agree with you. Now you got Romans 1.16. Preach the word. It's the power of God. That's your job. You got to go preach the word. You got to go evangelize. You got to go hand out tracts. Show people you're different. Let them see something different about you. One lady I witnessed to, she goes, wow, I don't want to interrupt you, but you have a smile on your face big, this big and your face is glowing. That's the glory of God. Or you Why? Might, because I love doing what I'm doing. Or you might meet somebody who hit rock bottom in their life, and you might turn their life around. Well, you're not going to turn their life around. Christ will well, he'll use you to get to that individual. Right, right. That's what it's about. Now you have over here, Colossians 2.10. This is where we're going to finish up. Bob, could you read 2.10? Colossians 2.10. Just give Brother Bob a second there. Yeah. Okay. Colossians 2.10 Therefore, do not let anybody judge you by what you eat or drink, or in regard to a religious festival, or a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Now, you see what Brother Bob just said to you? Okay? New moons, new days, celebrations, holidays. Is this what the world is still doing? People run to astrology. There's a holiday coming up. You're making it special. See, I like Thanksgiving. I think Thanksgiving is great. I love that, it too. That, that's a day of thanks. And you're giving thanks to God. Yeah, okay. families are getting together. I think Thanksgiving's great. The food's great. Christmas has become more of a worldly thing. Yes, sir. Because you don't know when Christ was born. But we kind of celebrate that at the end of the year because what's a week later? The new year. Yeah. So they stick it together. It's it's a material has become a materialistic. Easter, holiday. yes. Easter has become oh, that's when Christ rose from the dead. But they make it a bunny thing, the Easter bunny type of thing. Yes. Uh, so I don't know when he was resurrected from the dead. I don't know the month. I don't know the day. Yeah. 
Okay? That's all. But the main thing is, if you're a believer in Christ, you have to put your eyes and keep your eyes on Christ. Because when I go out to do shows and when I'm done and people come to me and talk to me, I talk about my faith. I talk about Christ. I put myself in the background because that's what Paul says. Paul says in his letters, God gets the glory. I'm doing this for Christ. I'm not doing it for Paul. I'm not doing this to show off. I don't want to get clapping from individuals. I'm doing this yeah. for Christ. Like these TV evangelists today. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I depend on Christ, his mighty power that works within me. You see where it is, what I'm talking about? It's right there. Yes. I work very hard at this. I depend on Christ's mighty power that works within me. So if I'm out there doing shows and God's using me as a tool, who's working the mighty power that's within me? Christ. So when I perform, Christ like is coming out of me. God's power is turned on. It's awesome. Okay? So now when people come to me, I talk about Christ. That's what Paul says right here. I don't depend on myself. That's flesh. You could be talented and you could be good, but there might be somebody who comes along that is spiritually is growing and God is almost like looking at that other individual and saying, you don't belong on that stage. That person belongs on that stage because when he's done, he talks about me. So you can't hold the candle to this individual because it's not the individual, it's me doing it. And I use that individual as a tool. This is what it's all about, people. We got to get our act together. We got to keep our eyes on Christ. When you pray, use the Word of God. It's all throughout Paul's letters. This is what I pray for. This is what I pray for. This is what I pray for. It's the Word. Too many Christians... I've been in this situation when they pray. It's all flesh. It's material things. Where's the word? You pray. Let the flesh go. Let the spirit take over. Pray in the spiritual realm, not in the flesh. Because when you pray in the spiritual realm, Jesus is almost looking at the Father saying, You hear that, Father? Man, that's what we want to hear. Yeah. That individual is grow, praying for other individuals to grow in the Word. That individual is praying for Christians to have the full armor of God on. That individual is praying for other Christians to be controlled and filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what it's about. That individual is praying for other Christians and even themselves that they know the traps and the deceiving of the devil. That individual is praying for other Christians to get out there, plant seeds, water seeds, bring people to Christ. It's the Word. We have to use the Word in prayer. Because the more you study the Word, and the more the Word comes into you, when you talk to God, God works through His Word. And when you pray to God, it's His Word coming out of you because you're fulfilled inside. This is all you know. This is all about Christ. So I want to thank Brother James, Brother Bob, and in conclusion, I'm going to pray for every believer and uh, people that don't know Christ. Thank you, and have a great day. Okay, you're going to pray now? Or and we, we, can, we can finish in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this time. I thank you that you filled us up with the Holy Spirit. I thank you that the Holy Spirit controlled this lesson, this teaching, and that your word is going to be given out, Lord, and that we will pray for individuals Christian individuals to get along with each other and not be like the world and not be like the flesh and come out of this world to motivate, to educate, to edify and build up the body of Christ and pray for each other and pray that they will grow, renew their mind in Christ, Father, and that they would be controlled by the Holy Spirit. They'll be in your word. They'll pray without season. They'll be in fellowship. They'll serve one another, keeping their eyes on Christ. You get the glory. Let your light shine in their life. I pray for the weak Christians. It's time to wake up. Everything you're doing, everything you're trying to do is passing away. 
It's time to wake up and put your eyes on Christ. Make them fall, Lord. Let them have troubled minds. Let the Holy Spirit convict them in such a way that they can't sleep. They're restless. They can't eat. Put them on their hands and knees to get back right with you. This is what we need in the body of Christ because there's too much going on. The devil has come in and deceived the body of Christ, these preachers, these teachers, these pastors, watering down a message. People are taking their eyes off of Christ. It's time for your people to wake up and put their mind and renew their mind on Christ. Humble themselves, love their enemies like Christ loved them. Go reach them lost people and bring them to Christ. This is a prayer now, and thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, outstanding. I just want to watch a little bit, or you got to. No, I want to. I want to thank the evangelist Can Create and uh, Brother Bob. Yep. I, I, it was great having you. This was a very special day, and I, 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 this was an exceptional, outstanding show here on Mega Life Twenty One Live. And I thank the both of you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. All right. This has been a Mega Life Twenty One production.